Welcome to the July 2020 edition of the Big Gay Fiction Book Club. I'm Jeff. And I'm Will. And as we sit here in the middle of the year, Christmas in July is really one of my favorite things to do because it brings a little festiveness to summer. And we're doing that all month on the podcast. And you've picked a great book to celebrate it right here in the book club. Yeah, this month's selection is Mr. Frosty Pants by Lita Blake. And Lita Blake is wildly popular. She has so many fans who absolutely adore her books. But this, I am embarrassed to say, is the first novel of hers that I've read. And frankly, I am glad that this was the first one. Because no surprise, loved it to pieces. And don't be embarrassed. It's my first one from Lita as well. So it, it's been a gap in both of our uh, reading histories to not have read a book from her before. But this was so good. And I have to say, I was a little surprised that you picked it too, because this runs a little higher on the ink scale, at least in my view, than what you tend to want to read. Oh, are we going there already? Yeah, I figure I'll just put that out there now <laughs> for people, because you historically <laughs> don't do much angst at all and as i got into this book i'm like wow you went on an edge and maybe it was tempered with the holiday goodness that happened as well well you are correct this is a little more angsty than i would normally choose when i was picking out this month's book i started reading mr frosty pants and i was really swept away by the two main characters there's a certain sense of longing that each of them have a longing for what was what they want and there's just this yearning that i just kind of identified with i empathized with them so I, I'm sort of splitting hairs, calling their yearning or longing. That really just falls under the category of angst. But I think in this particular case, I was fine with it, uh, especially when it came to the level of angst. Now, to be sure, Casey and Joel have a whole lot of stuff to work through in this story. But at the end, I just fell absolutely head over heels in love with them and um, i'm really glad that they could work through all of their stuff their angst you know the, the longing really is nice and we'll find those longing points as we dive into the discussion here for me the longing was a little separate from the angst just in how i split hairs <laughs> So, but I ate this up because of the longing that was sitting there because I, I don't mind the angstier stuff. So you want to dive us into the discussion? Yeah, let's talk about Mr. Frosty Pants. So our story starts out with Casey and he's back in Knoxville for the holidays, but things just aren't as festive as he hoped. He's taking an introspective drive through his old neighborhood where he grew up and his thoughts turn to Joel, the... Boy, that got away. Or if we're being perfectly honest, Casey was the one who ran away, but that's neither here or there. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. So Casey asked his mom whatever happened to Joel after he left for college in New York. She isn't a whole lot of help, but does have like a few vague details to share. Joel has taken over his father's home and garden business. And when she asked Casey to pick up the family Christmas tree, off he goes to Vreeland's. Yeah, because he was, he didn't want to go to Costco. Because why go to Costco when you can go check in on your long lost love? Even from chapter one, I had a very complex relationship with with Casey's parents. I, I don't much care for them. And that will become even more clear as we keep going. Because just her condescending treatment of Casey here was like, really, mom, that's the best you can do at Christmas? I don't think it's so much condescension. I think as we'll learn a little bit later as the story progresses, there's a certain pretentious veneer that his parents are. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah. Are, <laughs> that his parents are hell bent on, you know, keeping up that particular facade. So I think what you're feeling is that distance that they have, that cold detachment. Yeah, I, I could see that. I, I, I think you've categorized it quite well, actually. And speaking of cold and distant, the reunion Casey had imagined in his mind doesn't go quite as he expected when he sees Joel at the Christmas lot outside the Home and Garden Center. And seeing Casey forces Joel to remember the feelings that he had when they were teenagers and how Joel wanted nothing more than to kiss Casey as he sat and listened to Joel and his garage band rehearse. This is really one of those first places the longing really comes in. These two want each other so, so badly. 
there are so many things keeping them apart, both in their head and in their surroundings. It's one of the things that drug me into the story very quickly in the opening pages, because it's right there from the beginning how much they want their second chance, and they're both not clear how to even go about getting it. Let's talk about being in their heads. For most authors, chapters and chapters of introspection would be the death knell for any story, but in this particular case, I think it's what makes it so very special. I mean, chapter one, when Casey's just driving around his old neighborhood, it's really just him thinking about the past. And that, in most cases, would be deadly boring. It'd be a horrible info dump. But the way Lita Blake positions it and gets us deep into the the feelings and the emotions of these characters, it's really remarkable. It really is, because lots of this book is internal for both characters as they work through their stuff. But she infuses it with such emotion and so much passion for both characters that it doesn't matter that there's not other dialogue happening because there's its own particular movement of action going on even while we're in heads like that. So during a conversation about the merits of scotch pine versus fur, Casey tries to extend an olive branch, but Joel is angry and he's proud and he leaves Casey to pick out his own damn Christmas tree. (laughs) Joel goes home to his trailer and his dog. And we come to better understand some of the struggles that he's had over the years since Casey's been away. He goes online and looks at some of the pics Casey has posted of his new, amazing, fabulous gay life in the big city. And Joel knows that no matter how much he might want Casey, it was never meant to be. His protection over Casey, I found really both endearing and hard-headed at the same time. What do you mean protection? I don't, I'm not sure that's the word you're meaning to use i I think it is okay because even when they were kids you know joel was very aware that casey didn't quote unquote belong with them and he kept trying to get casey to go home and to not be around them because he knew he knew the relationship wouldn't work or shouldn't work because of, of both of their parents both sets of parents have their issues I think in his mind, if nothing else, I think he saw it as trying to protect Casey from what couldn't be and to push him away and push him away. And that's what he's trying to do here, too, is push him away because he perceives that he's not the one for him. And so let's make Casey go do the right thing. And seeing these pictures doesn't help because, of course, it's with the guy that Casey's recently broken up with as well, who who did have the parents approval. And it just kind of piles on, I think, for Joel to be, he needs to keep up his facade to help Casey go down the right path. That's how I see the protection playing into it. So once Casey has picked out a Christmas tree all by himself, he calls up RJ, an old friend and bandmate from Joel's garage band days, and asks him for some information about Joel. And RJ is able to fill him in on certain aspects of Joel's life that help explain his standoffishness. And Casey knows that he should probably stay away, but that doesn't stop him from the very next morning he shows up on Joel's doorstep and they finally hash things out. They were both afraid of what they wanted back then, but are finally able to admit now what they really feel. And Casey gives Joel his very first kiss. It is, of course, absolutely amazing, but Joel isn't about to let anyone into his life just yet. So after relaying the news of his first kiss to his friend Becca, who happened to be the other member of the Garage Band trio from back in the day, the book takes a short moment to flash back to the toxic, violent homophobia of Joel's father and the situation of what growing up in that house was like. Joel's dad is now in a nursing home, and very little of his attitude has changed. (laughs) If anything, it's gotten worse. From what we see in the book and and flashing back there, I felt so bad for Joel. Growing up with that is is terrible. And even as he continues to try to make things kind of right with his dad and take care of his dad and all dad wants to do is just basically start an argument. It's 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 sad and it doesn't help Joel be able to feel empowered to go after the life that he actually wants because he's so trapped in where he is. While decorating the family Christmas tree, Casey has to explain that he won't be spending a bunch of time with his parents. He plans on having lunch with Joel. 
And I think this illustrates sort of the crack in the very fancy facade that his parents are obsessed with maintaining. It just shows that Casey's family life isn't as warm and cuddly as they might want you to believe. (laughs) Yeah, this is crack one in the facade. (laughs) More cracks will be coming. They're certainly not happy that Joel split from the approved boyfriend and, you know, what that may mean. And now Casey's not available on his dad's schedule. Both of these guys are looking for ways to break out from their parents. And and we'll see that play itself out in the coming chapters as well. But this is the first crack in that for Casey, for sure. So lunch on the patio table behind Vreeland's goes very well for our two heroes. And we learn a little bit more about what they've been up to in the intervening years since they've been teenagers. And Casey took off for college. Joel spent some of his spare time writing horror novels. And he self-published several of them. I love this. This was such an unexpected little thing to find in the story i love that he is a part-time author trying to make a little extra coin on his books and casey explains the trouble he's having trying to tell his parents that the plans he has for school don't necessarily match up with their goals for his future the two of them even manage to discuss in a very roundabout way what each of them is looking for in a relationship. It's really sweet and very cute, and Casey kisses Joel again before making a date for later that evening. I really like how Casey takes the bull by the horns here. He's not going to have the constant push away anymore. He kissed him in the trailer. He's kissed him after lunch, and he's like, we are going to try to do something here while I'm home whether you're going to say yes to it or not. It's adorable, it's sweet, and it's kind of the kick in the pants that I think Joel needs too. So during their date, as they walk around downtown Knoxville, their conversation is frustratingly awkward at first. It goes a little too deep, too fast. But at dinner, they eventually they find their rhythm. And oh gosh, it's obvious they are so <laughs> into one another. Yeah, Joel finally, like, loosens up just a little bit and starts to let Casey's romanticizing take over and they finally get into a rhythm and you get this little glimpse here of what things can be when they're right with this couple but poor Joel I just I wish he could see beyond you know what limited time the holidays may have to to share for these guys yeah the walls that Mr. Frosty Pants have put up are finally starting to melt just a little bit Ice skating is next on the agenda, and Joel is absolutely terrible at it, which makes him very grumpy, uh, which Casey finds tremendously adorable. I think it's one of those fake grumpies, though, because it's not explicitly on the page, but I think Joel kind of enjoyed skating with Casey and Casey's amusement at his grumpiness. I don't think he totally hated it because I I think we've seen what real grumpy Joel looks like back at the tree lot. And this wasn't it. And I have to say that that Lita made me want to go to this place because the Smoky Mountain pork infused roll sounded really good. There's some good food going on in this date. And it really like captivated me just a little bit on the side. Made me really hungry when I read it. It's during the date that Joel decides that He'll let himself have this brief happiness, but honestly, Casey's going to be going back to school in New York, and it's still not meant to be in the long run, but maybe it's meant to be for right now, and that'll just have to be good enough for the time being. And during drinks later, Casey admits that his father was abusive as well, and while the conversation between the two of them is really heavy, I think the honesty of this shared experience brings them closer together later they go back to joel's place and casey makes sure that um his first time is very memorable that is very true it was a very very sweet and loving and really awesome first time depicted on a page like that it 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 was really Lita got all the feels out of that one, too, because it was just, it was beautiful. The next morning, Joel is, not surprisingly, a bit of a grump, but their morning after goes pretty well. Casey knows without a shadow of a doubt that he is absolutely head over heels in love, but decides to play it at least a little bit cool to keep from scaring Joel away. He knows 
all too well how to not spook Joel and when he can find things adorable like he did at the skating rink, but also when to kind of back away a little bit and give Joel the space so that he doesn't just totally freak out. Uh, He knows the man that he's after very well. So after spending a couple of chapters with our two heroes and their date and their falling ever deeper into love, Joel has to go deal with his hateful trash heap of a father. And then that afternoon, Casey is ambushed with a blind luncheon date that his parents have set up for him at their local country club. I hated this chapter. (laughs) It needed to be there. And, you know, it tells the story that it needs to tell. I guess more accurately, I just hate these parents. The, The parental units in this book for both guys are terrible. Casey's a little less so, but still terrible. I guess what, what, why I don't like them both so, so much is that usually at least one side of the parents is the one that one of the guys can always go to to talk to about a little bit. But here, both parents are bad in different ways, and it, it makes the story really good. But deep down, I didn't like these people at all. I wanted to punch them. So there. <laughs> In a phone conversation with Becca, Joel is told, in no uncertain terms, not to fuck this up. And that night, Casey brings dinner over to Joel's and they decorate the Christmas tree. It is sweet and it is charming and domestic. With things getting hot and heavy on the couch, Casey doing things to Joel with his mouth that crack him wide open. And being so open and vulnerable is something Joel wants, but is not necessarily sure that he can do. What I liked so much about the time here is they actually danced a little bit. I mean, Casey got Joel on his feet just a little bit to dance. And there was some good banter here, too, because Joel told Casey that he was lame and Casey told Joel that he loved it anyway. And, you know, it was a totally sweet moment. It kind of brought the skating rink home in in some ways and that feeling. And... It was sweet. It was another one of those swoony moments in their courtship. Yeah. And then in the weird way that the two of them have, they (laughs) talk it out in this sort of push-pull, abrasive, but loving thing that they do. And they talk about the possibility of a future, no matter how improbable or impossible it might seem. And Casey has a better vision of what that future could be than, than Joel does, because... He knows he's not necessarily going back to school, but nobody else, including Joel, quite wants to understand that. Casey invites Joel to the family Christmas party, and Joel says no, but at least he's considering it. I don't know why Casey would do this. I'm like, really? You just did that? This is not the place for that. (laughs) Think about who your parents are. And in a conversation with his mom, Casey tries to diplomatically put the kibosh on his mom's matchmaking. He has told her that Joel is the guy for him, but she is just not hearing it. No, she's really caught up in her perceptions of what her perceptions of the way that she wants Joel's life to go. And she's being stubborn and digging her heels in a little bit here, which is just making me not like her all the more. Joel eventually does decide to go. And despite a minor kerfuffle about being invited in the first place, things go relatively well for our two happy heroes. Casey takes a moment to show Joel some of the new cover designs that he's imagined for Joel's werewolf bulk, complete with a brand new marketing plan. It's so sweet of him to (laughs) to do that because, yeah, Casey's gone to school in marketing and he has taken it upon himself, kind of hearing over time how Joel's books don't do as well as they might be able to because he's doing so much of the work himself. He takes it on his shoulders to kind of remake that a little bit. And it's like, oh, that is so sweet. It's just so nice. As an author, I'm like, that's a super sweet gesture for somebody. Yeah. With Casey showing all of the thought and care he's put into this project, I think he's sort of very slowly trying to push Joel towards the idea that there is a future without explicitly saying, it's like, hey, let's get hitched. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's more showing him what, what the future can be like. The possibilities. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now, you ignored the fashion happening at the party, which I was totally endeared by. The fact that Casey is wearing a sweater with I'm with Frosty on it. I mean, that's that's a very cute nudge at Joel and at the, at the not secret nickname that 
that Joel actually has too. I thought it was, it was sweet and a little nudge, nudge, wink, wink at Joel. And thank God Joel didn't just totally bristle at it. (laughs) So the party continues, but later in the night, Joel overhears an argument between Casey and his dad. The gist of which is that Joel is low class trash. And if Casey continues this relationship with Joel, then he'll be completely cut off. Which is just about the last thing that Joel wants to hear. It goes back to what I mentioned before of Joel always trying to protect Casey. Joel's willing to live in misery to not disrupt Casey's life. Whether it's the life that his parents perceive for Casey or the life that Joel perceives for Casey. Because he can't view himself yet in that role. Yeah. Joel takes off deep down knowing that he's never been good enough. But he does have some pride. He won't beg for anyone's love, not his dad or Casey's father. And he certainly isn't going to let Casey throw everything away. So, yeah, things are super, super bad for our two heroes. And in romance, this is classically referred to as the black moment, where things are at their darkest. And from a story structure point, it shouldn't be too surprising this comes at the 75% point. (laughs) Exactly. I noticed that when I was reading on my Kindle. But here's something that I thought was interesting. What Lita does as a little something outside of the norm. Now, traditionally in a romance novel, once we get to the black moment, things sort of barrel towards the end where everyone says, I love you and church bells chime, you know, all that normal romancy (laughs) stuff. But with this particular book, things sort of roll towards a conclusion, which sounds kind of boring, I know, but let me try and explain what I mean. After this horrible moment at the party, Things don't necessarily explode or fall apart. The bond that Casey and Joel share is cemented. They know they're absolutely in love together. Maybe they can't possibly see uh, like a forever scenario, but they know that they're in love. So what's happened isn't going to stop that. And for the remainder of the book, it's really just about them slowly putting the pieces together and figuring out how they're going to get to that happily ever after. There's almost a little bit of slow burn romance in this book. And especially here in this last 25%, because you're right, most romance novels, once you click past this and you're in that dark moment, they do essentially pick up the pace. There's still 25% of the book left, but like the, the pace at which things happen seems to accelerate. Thank you. That because, was the word I was looking for. Yes. Because the heroes usually have to figure out, oh, wait, you're the one I'm meant to be with. Let me make this grand gesture. And then the end. It's like our two heroes have already had their very slow grand gesture and they already know that they're like meant to be together. So the story sort of takes a really interesting emotional Mm-hmm. slow roll to the finale. Yeah, I think it's important to say that it's not slow. I feel like where most romances do accelerate that last 25%, this one kept its overall pace that it had been on for the previous 75%. And and that made it to me just the more richer because we got to take all of the individual moments that needed to happen to get them to where they could really lock in for the HEA and we got to see all that play itself out. If Lita had sped up like most books would have, the emotional impact here would have been less. Yeah. So Casey realized what has happened and he goes to Joel and they discuss all the reasons why it's not going to work in the long run. And Joel is just tired. He just doesn't want to talk about it anymore. And he asked Casey to fuck him for the very first time. Because if you're not going to talk, why not fuck? Well, I think what we haven't explicitly (laughs) stated is is that Joel is a virgin. He's never been with anyone. Casey has always been like the one true guy for him. In a conversation that he has with Becca, it's insinuated that Joel might be demisexual, which means that he can only have a sexual relationship with someone that he is deeply attracted to and emotionally involved with which is certainly the case here with Casey. So Joel asked Casey to be his first. He literally, he just wants this one good thing. 
Which is if this is going to be the end of it, he just wants this one special night. And it's terrible that he feels that way, but it's also like, wow, you really know what you want here and you and you want to get this thing into your life and into your memory so that you'll have it. Casey realizes what's been asked for here and and he steps up, even though he's not willing to give up on the man either for the future. So Casey rocks his world Mm -hmm. and they end up doing it several times over the course of the night and they wake up in each other's arms on Christmas Day. As they have breakfast, Casey calls his mom, telling her that he won't be coming over. He's spending the day with Joel. And if they have a problem with that, too damn bad. And he makes it explicitly clear if it comes down to a choice between the man he loves or finishing school and their family's money, then he chooses Joel. Which, of course, immediately mortifies Joel. But Casey explains that his dad makes these overtures all the time and then regrets them and backpedals. And Casey doesn't believe that NYU is off the table in terms of his dad. Joel goes to visit his dad for the very last time. He says that he's gay and that he has found love. And he's sorry if he's a miserable old fuck, but he's not going to take this abuse anymore. Thank God. He should have walked away from his dad years ago. I mean, I get that that's not easy. Joel's talked about why that's not easy, but I'm glad that he finally found the the strength to break away from the toxic family member. Joel and Casey spend the night cuddled up on the couch watching Christmas movies and exchanging gifts. And Joel gives Casey a ring that once belonged to his mother. It's a symbol of, well, it's they don't know what the future holds for the two of them. They haven't quite figured that out yet. But Joel wants Casey to know with a, a shadow of a doubt that he is 100% all in. This was a big move for Joel. And I was so happy that he did it since he's always been the one who didn't think it would work to give this ring over with such a beautiful gesture. I kind of cheered a little bit for him (laughs) that he was able to, with everything that had gone on with the families on both sides, that he was able to take this leap with Casey and do the ring. I want to stop for just a moment and make sure that it's clear that Joel isn't necessarily the sad sack that he might sound like. Joel was deeply alone for a very long time. The only person in his life was his terrible father. And for most of the book, Joel is dealing with feelings of worthiness, especially in his relationship with Casey. Every time the two of them have sex, Joel ends up crying, which he's a little bit embarrassed by. But I think it speaks to the deep emotion that he's feeling and the honest connection that he has with Casey and the way that he is finally being able to open up and access some of those emotions that he's buried and find his true happiness. He's never really had this kind of love before. It's clear that his mom loved him, but I don't think his father maybe ever did, especially once his mom died. And then dad was just a dick going forward He's got friends in Becca and RJ, but they're not there. They, they live elsewhere now. And Casey's really unlocking all those emotions for the very first time. And I think it's appropriate that he cries. And, he's, and you're also right. He's not sad. He's proud. Proud to a fault mm-hmm. in some cases. And it's something that Casey just doesn't put up with. Casey doesn't care that he doesn't have money, that, he, that, that Casey's the one who's perhaps buying the food, even though it drives Joel crazy. But over the course of the book, Joel sees that he can be taken care of and that it doesn't mean that he's less than in any way. Proofed even more with, you know, the marketing work that Joel's been doing on the books and also the 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 garden store to help turn things around a little bit even. It's it's a really the whole book is really a wonderful journey for both of these guys, but particularly Joel, I think, because he not only ends up in a wholehearted relationship, but also comes more into the man that he probably should have been all along. The day after Christmas, Joel pays Casey's dad a visit, and he is willing to say just about anything to keep Casey from being cut off from his family. I was a little disappointed with this because after the the nice overture of the ring that he would go and do this stuff with Casey's dad. It worked out in the long run. It was just... why I don't understand why you're disappointed. 
what what's going on is he's willing to do anything so that Casey's life isn't thrown irrevocably off track, which means lying to Casey's dad. What he's eventually, this is the classic moment where the disapproving parent offers the person money to, you know, leave their child's life forever. And that's what Casey's dad does. I would have preferred this scene to have played out without Joel being the one to go say, here's how this is going to go down. Please don't cut Casey off. As opposed to Casey's dad just coming to Joel and say, look, here's $10,000. Please leave my kid alone. Joel instigated it. And I was like, oh, I wish you hadn't done that. But I mean, I get why he did it. I would have just hoped that by now he was past that because Casey was totally fine being cut off. Does that make sense? Probably not to you, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> no, not it doesn't make any sense at all. You're totally getting it wrong. There you go. <laughs> it had to happen eventually here that I would be told I was wrong. 20, but... 24 hours earlier, Joel didn't think he deserved love. Now he does. He knows that Casey is without a shadow of a doubt. He's the one. But... He goes to Casey's dad and he says, you know what? Don't cut your son off. Don't worry about it. This thing will burn out eventually naturally. Just wait. You'll see. It won't last, which is a total lie. He's head over heels in love with Casey. He's lying to his dad to keep things status quo. Joel knows what he's doing. He's trying to play both sides and make sure the outcome is something that they can all live with. We're just going to disagree on this one, <laughs> which is fine. Listeners, let us know what you think of this and tell us who's right <laughs> in this case and how you thought Joel behaved in this matter. Joel is fighting for his man. He's doing the right thing. <laughs> so after a meeting with his parents, Casey lets Joel know that there has been a truce of sorts. Casey will return to New York and finish school, but will have to prove his independence if that's what he actually wants, which it, of course, is. It'll be Casey and Joel moving forward, and that is, of course, non-negotiable when it comes to his parents. Which is exactly the way it's supposed to be. On New Year's Eve, the two of them are in downtown Knoxville, where our heroes are joined by Becca and RJ via FaceTime. Joel kisses his man at midnight, and he is happy. He's worried about the future, but he is happy nonetheless. He is no longer Mr. Frosty Pants. Mm -mm. Nope. Which brings us to the epilogue. One year later on Christmas Eve, Casey is now living with Joel and they make sweet love, content in the life that they have started together. Later, they spend Christmas Day with Casey's parents and then drive to the old neighborhood where the two of them grew up. Casey gets down on one knee and he proposes. Joel gets down on a knee and proposes right back. Which is so sweet. I love the double <laughs> proposal. It's really cute and quite adorable, considering what our two heroes have been through, bringing the story to a happy conclusion. Mm -hmm. A totally satisfying HEA. So that is Mr. Frosty Pants. And despite the fact that you got it totally wrong about Joel, I think you... <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I got it fatally wrong. I just didn't like that one moment. <laughs> I think you and I can both agree that we both really appreciated what Lita Blake did here with our two main characters. We went really deep with the two of them. They both had a lot of stuff to deal with. But in the end, the journey was well worth it. I really fell hard for Joel and Casey. I really like how Lita didn't pull any emotional punches here mm -hmm. uh, it was all there and really going through what these two guys had to go through both in their journeys to each other and with their external situations as well with the parents it was heartfelt it was beautiful i adored it and you know once again you you found the perfect book for book club and I wanted to read more Lita Blake to see how, <laughs> to see other stories that she tells now that I've seen the emotion that she can put into the page. Yeah. Speaking of emotion, here's a little book club behind the scenes secret. When I chose this book at the beginning of the month, I, I started reading it and I said, yes, this is definitely the one we want to read. But then I briefly set it aside. And when I discuss books here on the book club episodes, I need copious notes in order to keep track of the plot and the 
various, you know, emotional stuff that I, I want to discuss because I can't remember anything. I'm at that particular age. So what ended up happening is I had to go back to the beginning of the book and over a 24 hour period, I read the entire thing, which is something I never, ever do. But in that very compact time, I was deeply drawn into what Casey and Joel were going through. And they felt so very real to me. And I have to say that I did not mind the angst. Maybe you're turning in your old age to maybe you could do a little more angst in your reads. <laughs> maybe. Who knows? We'll have to see. But I also agree that this was a particular kind of angst. It was heavy in areas. But like you said, a lot of it tied back to a longing that just played your emotions a little differently than being hit over the head with an angst. Yeah, I'm not going to be reading dark romances anytime soon, but okay, <laughs> I, I can read a little bit of angst. Thank you, Lita Blake. Just a quick note before we wrap things up. The audiobook for Mr. Frosty Pants is read by John Solo, and I loved it to pieces. His performance, especially in the case of these two particular characters, was really wonderful. We spoke in the beginning of this particular episode about the introspection and some of the emotions that are explored through the backstory that the two characters are telling us. And Lita Blake writes it in a way that it is perfect to be performed for audio. I think the audiobook is something really special. And if you haven't read Mr. Frosty Pants, I think you might want to give the audiobook a try. I think it's really, really good. Yeah, I'll just second that. John did a great job with both Casey and Joel. He, he hit their emotional marks just perfectly. And this book is actually the first in a series. It continues with Mr. Naughty List, which finds RJ, the former friend and bandmate of our two main characters, who finds himself back in Knoxville for the holidays and he ends up following for a former teacher. It does, in fact, sound very sexy and very naughty. <laughs> so if you're interested in RJ which I really liked this character in this book, I think I might have to give Mr. Naughty List a try. So we hope you've enjoyed our deep dive discussion of Mr. Frosty Pants. We would love to know what you thought of this book. If you'd like to leave us a comment, you know what to do. Go to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. For Jeff and myself, we want to thank you again for joining us for this month's book club pick. Stay tuned because we'll have an announcement of what August's book club pick will be soon. Until next time, everyone, please stay strong, be safe, and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.